Can you picture it? Hundreds of thousands of people crowded around in front of the tent of meeting right within sight of the altar where the sacrifices will be made. People are wondering, will God show us his presence as promised or will he break out in wrath against us? If you know your Bible or anything about the Bible, Leviticus screams law. And so we think of law and grace as polar opposites, but they're not, especially here in the Old Testament. We will see, as we have, and we'll continue to see, just how abundant God's grace and mercy is through the tabernacle and the sacrificial law that we've been exploring. Two two words come to mind, and they they tend to be a little fancy, but I think probably most of us uh, in high school or above have heard these words, eminence and transcendence. So the, the idea that God is imminent, that means he is near us. And we as Protestants, if we're honest, this is where we tend to lean toward. Our buildings tend to be smaller, and our worship tends to be less complex and more familiar. And we sing songs that are true. Uh, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. We sing songs that that Jesus is our, our friend, and that is, of course, absolutely biblically true. But at times we lose the otherness of God, the transcendence the bigness, the majesty of God. Now, as Christians, we can look at the mountains and be reminded or at a a massive waterfall and go, wow, that's huge. How big is our God? We lose sight of this and there's a danger to losing sight of this, this transcendence of God. And I think the dialogue between Susan and Lucy and Mr. Beaver in C.S. Lewis's classic children's book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, capture this well. I'm going to read just a short passage from that book. Susan asks, who is Aslan? Aslan, Mr. Beaver said. Why don't you know? He's the king. It is he, not you, that will save Mr. Tumnus. Is he a man? asked Lucy. Aslan a man? said Mr. Beaver sternly. Certainly not. I tell you, he is the king of the wood and the son of the great emperor beyond the sea. Don't you know who is the king of the beasts? Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan. I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Uh, That you will, dearie, and no mistake, says Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or else just silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. So in Narnia, the imaginary land of C.S. Lewis's seven books. Aslan the lion is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's Jesus, allegorically speaking, in the book. And while he's not safe, he's good. And his incredible kindness to anyone who calls on his name as king to be saved is shadowed here in Leviticus chapter 9. Stand with me and open up your Bibles, if you would. Uh, Page 60 in your paper pew Bibles, Leviticus chapter 9 verses 1 through 7. Again, Leviticus chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. On the eighth day, Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel, and he said to Aaron, Take for yourself a bull calf for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering, both without blemish, and offer them before the Lord. And say to the people of Israel, Take a male goat for a sin offering and a calf and a lamb, both a year old without blemish for a burnt offering, Verse 4, and an ox and a ram for peace offerings to sacrifice before the Lord, and a grain offering mixed with oil. For today the Lord will appear to you. Verse 5, and they brought what Moses commanded in front of the tent of meeting, and all the congregation drew near and stood before the Lord. And Moses said, this is the thing that the Lord commanded you to do, that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. Then Moses said to Aaron, draw near to the altar and offer your sin offering and your burnt offering. And make atonement for yourself and for the people. And bring the offering of the people and make atonement for them as the Lord has commanded. May God bless the reading of his word. Let us pray again. Lord, we 
humble ourselves before your word. We bow and recognize that your word, unlike any other words in any passage, in any book ever written, your word alone has the power to transform our hearts, to show us who you are, and to bring us into a realization of how far we fall short of your glory. We are really rebels asking for your mercy and thanking you that you gave it with love in your son, Jesus. May he, our great Aslan, King of kings and the Lord of lords, our great Lion of Judah, may he be magnified greatly through the preaching of his word and in our hearts and through our hands this week. We pray all these things in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> if you're new to the church, I'd encourage you to pull out your bulletin. You'll notice there is a, a, a little insert there. You can see an outline of the, the sermon. <clears throat> and you can follow along and take as many notes as you'd like or draw cool pictures. Every once in a while, kids come and say, Pastor, look at the picture I drew. And I think that's awesome. It's beautiful. Some of them are a little silly, but it's, it's a joy that they're here and that you are and I together under God's word. So our title for today's passage is simply, The Glory of the Lord Appears Among Us People. And our passage really follows a very logical progression here. Moses conveys the Lord's instructions and promise, verses 1 through 7, what we just read. Aaron draws near to make his offerings, verses 8 through 14. Aaron presents the people's offerings, verses 15 through 21. The promised glory of the Lord appears, 22 through 24. And then as we have made our habit, we want to see Jesus through Leviticus. And so point five, the glory of the Lord shining in Jesus. <clears throat> well, let's begin with our title. The glory of the Lord appears among his people. And let's listen to Moses' instructions to his people. We, we left off last week, and, and a big thank you to my brother in Christ, Jason, for leading us well last week. We left off with the priests. And there, if you will, they're getting prepared to serve God. So last week, Aaron and his sons were left with the following instructions at the end of chapter 8. And had we, like many Old Testament believers, heard this, we would have heard this reading all the way through chapter 1 to the end. So these words would have been ringing in our ears as chapter 9 began, verse 35 of chapter 8. At the entrance of the tent of meeting, you, that is Aaron and his sons, the priests, shall remain day and night for seven days, performing what the Lord has charged, so that you do not die, for so I have been commanded. And Aaron and his sons did all the things the Lord commanded by Moses. So Aaron and his sons were faithful. The seven days are complete, and that is why our passage begins, verse 1, chapter 9, on the eighth day. On the eighth day tells us, that the seven days of consecration were complete. They obeyed. Aaron and his sons are still living. They have not been punished by death. <clears throat> but it's also worth noting the significance of the eighth day. It's a theme throughout our scriptures. I mean, think of, think of creation. The Lord made the heavens and the earth in six days. On the seventh day, he did what? He rested the Sabbath. And then the eighth day begins the beginning of the, the work week. Think of the eighth day for every Jewish husband and wife who welcome in their son. On the eighth day, the sun is circumcised. And probably the most remarkable eighth day in all of history is the resurrection. For Jesus is crucified, <clears throat> and they have that quiet Saturday on the Sabbath, and then he is raised on the eighth day, the Lord's day as we call it now. So the, the eighth day is powerful and purposely symbolic in our scriptures. It's the day of God's new and good work. Well, chapters or chapter or verse, the first seven verses, I should say, summarize Moses' instructions. Did you pick those up? Notice in verse two, he begins with Aaron. So everyone's gathered near. They can hear Moses if they're close enough. And Moses first addresses Aaron and he says, <clears throat> take for yourself a bull calf for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Why? Well, Aaron is going to be acting as the high priest. These are his sacrifices for his relationship with the Lord. And notice, if you remember from our first sermon in the first seven chapters of the book, there's a slight difference in the offering that he is commanded to make. For a sin offering, 
it is typical to bring a male bull. But here we have a bull calf. We'll flip back to Exodus 32. And you're already probably thinking, oh, I get it, Exodus 32. So just some weeks, maybe maybe day, maybe months before, we're not sure the time frame exactly, but Moses and his people, having been freed from Egypt, traveled to Mount Sinai through the parting of the Red Sea and the destruction of Pharaoh's army, and they arrive at the, the, the foot of the mountain, and God is going to give them the law. And so he, God lands at the top of the mountain, boom, and fire and flame, and the people tremble. And only Moses is allowed to come up. Well, Moses has been up 40 days when we read Exodus 32. And this is what we read, verse 1. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And so Aaron commands them in the next verse to take off their rings and their gold, the, the, uh, the, the parents and the kids. So they're all in this together. Verse 4, and Aaron receives the gold from their hand and he fashioned with it a graving tool and made from it a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Then Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, today or tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose to play. And we read, if we were to keep going, God telling Moses, I'm going to break out and wipe these people off the planet, for they have sinned horribly against me. I freed them from Egypt, and they worship a golden man-made calf. Moses, of course, intercedes, and only a portion of the people are killed. So I think, and many rabbis, this is not new to me, this is from the rabbis of old, all saw this as a personal sin offering for Aaron. A, a calf to remind him of his sin in leading the people of Israel into sin. <clears throat> so he is commanded to bring the, the, the bull calf and a ram and a burnt offering without blemish as always. These need to be perfect and, and costly. And then he says to the people of Israel, take a male goat, verse three, for a sin offering and a calf and a lamb, both a year old without blemish for a burnt offering and an ox and a ram for peace offerings to sacrifice before the Lord, and a grain offering mixed with oil, for today the Lord your God will appear to you. <clears throat> and so we notice the people have more sacrifices to make, a sin and a burnt and a peace offering, and they too have to bring a calf. We're being reminded of their participation in the sin of the golden calf. But there's this promise that rings out so positively, we might miss it, but they certainly didn't. Verse 4, today the Lord will appear to you and assumed is in your midst, not at the mountain far away, up high out of reach, but right here among them. And so verse 5, as is often the case with us, we respond to a promise with obedience. They brought what Moses commanded in front of the tent of meeting. And all the congregation drew near and stood before the Lord. Can you picture it? Hundreds of thousands of people crowded around in front of the tent of meeting right within sight of the altar where the sacrifices will be made. Repetition in any book or any poem for that matter is often a, a sign of the theme or the main idea. And so you'll notice repetitions. You've probably already noticed them. Drawing near is said three times in quick succession. And you'll also notice altar and, and blood and some other terms that we'll highlight as we go on. But here, drawing near is key. First, the people draw near. Second, Moses commands Aaron twice to himself draw near and to bring or to draw near with the people's offering. Same word, just a different translation to clarify the meaning. What's well, only repeated twice and is only mentioned here twice is atonement. And it's key, for it gives us the why to what we're doing. Why all this sacrifice? Why are we going to read of Aaron and the priests slaughtering all these animals, spilling out their blood? Why? Because we need to pay for our offense to our creator God. And the fancy word for that is atonement or at one meant uh, to bring us back into unity 
when we were split from God due to the sins of our forefathers and our own. So this is why Aaron is drawing near. This is why the people are drawing near. This is the why, why they're bringing sacrifices because God has said through his mercy, I will spare your life if you shed the innocent life of these animals according to my law. And so we call this gracious act of God substitutionary atonement. Uh, we, we see this, of course, in the military more than we should. It's the, it's the brother in, in the foxhole or the brother in battle who steps in front of the bullet to save his other brother. He sheds his life to save the other ones. Here, God is, is merciful in that it's not a human life here that is at risk or that will be shed, but, a, but an animal. One that is, that is out without blemish. It's, it's, it's not hobbled. It's not diseased. It's young. It's costly to the owner. We learned that a couple weeks ago. And it's a substitute. <clears throat> our sin, friends, is that serious. And our songs that we sing and the scriptures that we read tell us this. Despite what the world says, we are not inherently good. We were made to be good. We have that great potential. But we are permanently flawed. Rebels by birthright and by choice. And so God graciously but rightly demands obedience here to Aaron and to the people, and then by implication, you and I. The question is, will it work? Will Aaron and his sons do the priestly work rightly? Or is there more of God's wrath coming, just like after the golden calf incident? Well, let's keep reading in verse 8 through 14. Aaron draws near to make his offerings Aaron drew near to the altar and killed the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself. And the sons of Aaron presented the blood to him and he dipped his finger in the blood and put it on the horns of the altar and poured out the blood at the base of the altar. But the fat and the kidneys and the long lobe of the liver from the sin offering he burned on the altar as the Lord commanded Moses. The flesh and the skin he burned up with fire outside the camp. Verse 12, then he killed the burnt offering. So it was first the sin offering, now the burnt offering. And Aaron's sons handed him the blood and he threw it against the sides of the altar. And they handed the burnt offering to him piece by piece and the head and he burned them on the altar. And he washed the, the entrails, the guts and the legs and the clean and burned them with the burnt offering on the altar. So first, first thing to notice, Aaron and his sons are obedient. They are properly offering up the sin offering and the burnt offerings as Moses uh, via God commanded. Two, notice the repetitious words here, altar and blood. So the people are gathering, drawing near. They cannot go into God's presence in the tent of meeting at this point yet, but they're drawing near to the altar. Boy, isn't that true to you and I? We come to God our Father through the altar of sacrifice of the Son. But this is a shadow of the real thing, and so let's unpack that still while we're here in the Old Testament. We'll wait to talk about Jesus here at the end. So there's altar and there's blood. And you notice the blood is, is splattered against the altar and the priest carefully takes his thumb and then dips it into the altar and covers even the tips of the altar. So the entire altar is covered in blood and it is gross and it is smelly and it is a very, very tangible reminder of the cost of our sin. And yet that blood, given in obedience, sanctifies the altar. And the... <clears throat> the uh, the sin offering is partially burnt on the altar. The rest is burned outside the camp. <clears throat> and the burnt offering is entirely consumed on the altar. And everything is done in accordance with chapter 1 and 4 of the burnt and the sin offering. Now Aaron turns to present the people's offerings, verses 15 through 21. And notice the repetition of the word offering here. Then he, that is Aaron, presented the people's offering and took the goat of the sin offering that was for the people and killed it and offered it as a sin offering like the first one. And he presented the burnt offering and offered it according to the rule. And he presented the grain offering and took a handful of it and burned it on the altar besides the burnt offering of the morning. And then he killed the ox and the ram, the sacrifice of peace offerings for the people. And Aaron's sons handed him the blood and he threw it against the sides of the altar. But the fat pieces of the ox and of the ram, the fat tail and that which covered the entrails, and the kidneys and the long lobe of the liver. They put the fat pieces on the breasts 
and he burned the fat pieces on the altar. But the breasts and the right thigh, Aaron waved for a wave offering before the Lord as Moses commanded. So Aaron moves on from his own sacrifice to the people's sacrifices. We saw a sin offering, verse 15, burnt offering, 16, the grain offering, and finally the peace offering. And the blood is thrown on the altar and it is covered. And as is significant for the peace offering, which by the way is a a foreshadowing of our Lord's Supper that we celebrate, the priest waves the offering, the, the thigh <clears throat> and uh, I'm sorry, the breast and the right thigh and keeps them and eats them. They partake of the offering. They in- ingest it just as we do with the bread and the cup. And all this is done faithfully. And the people are watching and observing all of this as Aaron and his sons do as Moses commanded. And Moses, of course, is standing right there watching them offer and offer and offer before the altar. Friends, this is worship. This is Israel's first worship service before the Lord. Again, the question is, have they done it rightly? The people are wondering this. We know the answer already. People are wondering, will God show us his presence as promised or will he break out in wrath against us? Verse 22. The promised glory of the Lord appears. Then Aaron lifted up his hands towards the people and blessed them. And he came down from offering the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. You can imagine the pregnant pause there. They go into the tent. They're out of sight now. Moses was out of sight for 40 days at the mountain. We don't know how long Moses and Aaron disappear, so to speak. We don't know what transacted there or what happened if God said anything at all or if they heard anything, or anything else happened. But they entered in, and before they entered in, Aaron prays a blessing over them. And this will, <clears throat> will not be in your, in your slides probably, but you know it. I, we're going to say it again for the benediction today. He probably said these very words from Numbers chapter 6. Listen to them carefully. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So the blessing here is for God's favor, his kindly face, his love and mercy to be upon them, his peace, not his wrath. So the people are nervous, they're anxious, they're excited. All of those emotions bundled into one. Moses and Aaron could be annihilated like that. We're not sure. And yet they walk out and we read these words. And when they came out, they blessed the people, probably reiterating those same words which they had hoped would be true prior and now have been. For Moses and Aaron are alive and well. They came out, they blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. And we don't know what that looks like, but they saw it. For the verb here clearly means they saw God's glory. Perhaps it was the cloud, the pillar of cloud, if it was day or the the, the fire by night. There was something already obvious that God was there right in their midst. And they were alive. And then verse 24, and then fire came out from before the Lord. We don't know what this looks like, but boys, imagine with me, all the Marvel movies you've seen, fire shooting out somehow, either from the pillar or from the heavens. And it hits the altar like a truck and absorbs Uh, takes everything with it, licking up every bit of bone and flesh and fat, leaving the altar totally clean and dry. Just like with Elijah later at Mount Carmel. And when all the people saw this, with their very own eyes, they shouted and fell on their faces. Now, at at first read, uh, I probably thought too that shouting meant you know, like screaming, like, like you're scared, like a jump scare. We were just watching a movie last night and there were some jump scares. But that's actually not what it, the verb means here. The verb is what we were reading in Psalm 20. It's shouts of joy, of worship. Hallelujah! God is with us. He's with us. God's glory. We can see it with our own eyes. 
They've seen it in the mountain far away, but could not come up the mountain. Moses stood before the tabernacle at the end of Exodus, but could not go in because God's glory was there. But now they are right up on the tent and God is with them. And he has, boom, just destroyed, consumed the sacrifice to show them he is pleased and will dwell among them in peace. Psalm 20, verse five, which we read earlier, may we shout for joy over your salvation. In the name of our God, set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions, the psalmist reads. And so the people shout out with joy, with awe, with amazement, and then they get low. Oh, they get low. They bow down. What are the words here? Literally, they fell on their faces, prostrate on the ground. Why? Because God is holy. And throughout scriptures, whenever God appears, our natural instinct is to get low, for we know that we come from dirt and will return to dirt. And that he has but to wish to wipe us out, and he could. And he'd be absolutely just, because our good works are dirty rags to him. We have no way to justify ourselves for all the times we've hated him or not even thought about him. And yet these people are alive, and God is with them, and they are worshiping him. So how much greater, friends, is the glory that we see in Christ? Point number five. John chapter one. A great, a great book to read, by the way, if you're, if you're not a Christian, if you're, or you're a seeker, you're wondering, is this Christianity really true? Start with John and, and find one of your friends who are Christians and say, would you read with me? Or vice versa, my Christian brothers and sisters. If you have some friends who don't know Jesus, who don't have eternal hope in him, just sit down over coffee over, over a couple months and just read John's gospel. Don't worry, it'll do all the work you and I can't. It certainly did in my heart, and it's done it in many of our hearts. Amen? And so we read in John chapter 1, verse 14, and the word, capital W here for God, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen, what have we seen? His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father. So Jesus has a glory that is only because he is the Son of God himself, full of grace and truth. Verse 16, from, for from his fullness of grace and truth, we have received grace upon grace. Jesus pours out his grace. There is no limit. There is none too sinful to come to Jesus and say, save me. Verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, just as we've read it in Leviticus. Grace and truth finally come through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who was at the Father's side. He has made him known. Oh, it is good. And Jesus is greater than the Old Testament tabernacle. And Hebrews, will close with this passage, chapter 12, perfectly captures this moment in our <clears throat> our response as Christians to the Old Testament shadow of the gospel. Verse 18, For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. That's Israel at the Mount of Sinai. Moses, please, don't let God speak to us anymore. We're afraid he'll kill us. Verse 20, for they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned, the Lord said through Moses in that chapter. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But, but you, who are in Christ, have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who were enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator, your mediator, through a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, his own blood, that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel killed by his son, or by his brother, Cain. And hear the warning in verse 25. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking, that is Jesus. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. So, friends, you know this in Christ. Jesus is not with us anymore, but he is with us in heaven. 
We say he is risen on Easter morning because he is alive and well, but we cannot see him with our physical eyes. We can see him with our heavenly eyes, with our spiritual eyes. And we can imagine the heavenly Jerusalem and the angels and the day that we will join them together saying, holy, holy, holy. So I beg you today to consider if you are in Christ, to to continue to let his sacrifice speak on your behalf. To continue to be reminded of the good news of your salvation. that You do not have to re-sacrifice animals every day spilling blood, but that Jesus' blood was once shed for all, for he is eternal. And if you're outside of Christ, if you're not sure, friends, you have no guarantee of tomorrow. And if tomorrow you face your judge, what hope do you have? But you do have hope in Christ. And the song that we sang earlier today captures it so well. And these are my closing words to you. Call now, O sinner, on your coming judge, Jesus, to be here even now as your Savior. Let's pray. Jesus, there are so many voices uh, clamoring for our attention in this world on social media, on the TV news networks, on the books that we read, and just there's just so many ways in which we <clears throat> can be easily distracted. Oh, Holy Spirit, help us to focus clearly on you, Jesus, and to see you for who you are our sacrifice once and for all. Help us to respond by faith and to walk in grace and to share with others the good news. And may you get all the glory for what you will do through your people and your church. And it is in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.